Winter is almost over. Here in Iowa, we're kind of dying. I don't like being cold. But one thing that the kind of closing of winter means is more travel, more adventure, more camping. And we're so excited to get outside and uh, take some fun adventures. And the rooftop tent for me and for my family has really been a game changer, especially for my wife who in- likes being comfortable and off the ground and not so vulnerable. Um, so think about that. But we have had a few different brands of tents over the years. And then we finally discovered FSR, Free Spirit Recreation, and they just took a new innovative approach to the rooftop tent game. And their high country tent, which we've used for thousands and thousands of miles, many, many nights, um, is really an amazing piece of uh, just well-designed gear. Um, and, and one thing I've always found super annoying about rooftop tents, and some of you who are listening that have rooftop tents can relate to this, is like zippers and the springy pole things. Those things just became a real annoyance to me, almost to the point where I didn't want to use the rooftop tents anymore. But FSR has none of those. And seriously, in my opinion, it's some of the easiest to use and set up gear on the market. And they have some really new, exciting innovations that are going to be even better for 2020. One that I have on pre-order is the new Odyssey 55 Tri-Layer. We'll talk more about the Tri-Layer tech uh, in, an, in another episode um, in, in another time. But the Odyssey is a sleek-looking, load-carrying, uh, capable, hard-shell rooftop tent. Seven inches of total height in the closed position. Just a really cool kind of industrial, chic look. Um, it'll look right on your vintage 4x4 or any vehicle for that matter. But also just love so many things. And we're going to talk more about this tent in the future. But go check out uh, the FSR Odyssey 55. You can check it out on Go FSR's social media or on their website. And uh, get one on pre-order, man. It's going to be fun. But elevate your next adventure with FSR. Go check them out. All right. Thanks for checking in. Today, we talked to a good and longtime friend of mine and of the shop, Stuart Schoen, and he's very highly qualified to talk about this topic that we're going to discuss. We're going to discuss around the, around the idea of doing a build or customizing a project, which is something we're all prone to do. How do we make our uh, trucks or cars work better? How do we make them drive better? How do we make them more reliable? faster. There's so many questions about this, but we talk about three big questions that everybody's asking. No, not who's going to be the next Democratic presidential nominee. What about, forget about the meaning of life. We're going to discuss the most important question. How do you determine if you should leave it stock or modify it? What are the pros and cons of modifying it? Is there a point that's just too much. You've taken it too far and it begins to go against what you wanted it to do. And lastly, what are the benefits of swapping it to more modern, you know, to, to modern technology or modern drivetrain? We discuss this and more on the show today. Thanks again for listening. And if you feel so led, tell a friend about the podcast. Um, we're just so stoked to be able to do this and talk to people and grateful that uh, you take the time to listen. So thanks again. Enjoy the show. Welcome to the show today. We are kicking off the new year right and here with a really good friend of mine, uh, Stuart. Welcome everyone, Stuart Schoen. Thank you very much. I um, I want to uh, put a plug in for Sean. Uh, I want to sp- say shout to the world from, from the rooftops that Sean is um, one of the nicest uh, people I've ever met in my life. Um, a good person who... Um, you just can't help but but root for and and want to to help and support and see succeed and um, I didn't we didn't plan that I was going to drop that on you but yeah, it's, thank it's you. Uh, beyond true and it's a real pleasure to be here. This is if this is my 15 minutes of fame, I'm super happy with it. That's awesome. Um, great to be here. Yeah, and super thankful that you've done. We've been like I've had probably three or four episodes worth of stuff. I just really want to talk to you about. Yeah, and uh, awesome. Stuart's a fascinating guy, um, and. 
back at you, man. Like you've been a source Thank of you. wisdom in my life. Super hospitable. I'm here yeah. in Phoenix, chilling. Yep. Uh, we're going to Barrett Jackson, yep. hanging out. Yep. Um, Phoenix is a great town. Come see it, everybody. And I remember like some of my earliest memories back in San Jose, anything mm-hmm. scout days when you were building this truck right behind us. Yep. Um, about like, man, this, cause I didn't know you at all. I just like, this guy really likes details and really likes to dig into the engineering and the why behind stuff. So, yeah. and as I've gotten to know you, it's one of the things I enjoy most is like talking details with you. The Thank way you, you geek out to like particulars yeah. is unlike anyone I've ever met. So that's, Thank you. that's, that's a, a big cool, compliment. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. And in this episode, we're going to talk about, yeah, I, I've been thinking about a, a, a slick title, but we're essentially going to talk about how, when to modify, when to keep stock, when yeah. to swap, Yep. how much is too much, kind of what are the values that drive those certain things. Before we start on this episode, I do want to thank uh, Kenda Tire. And we normally like, we're going to, just from a podcast perspective, sometimes it's awkward to do an ad while you're talking to a guest, but Stuart has unique experience. Stuart, you have some Cleaver RTs on your Orange Scout 800. Yep. Um, How do you like them? What's been the experience? I like them a lot. And um, to be perfectly frank, I, I... Put them on the car at your suggestion and encouragement. Yep. Um, probably like a lot of people, um, I uh, would pretty much would would. Um, it wasn't even a thing to consider. I'd put you know whatever the leading competitor for that tire is. Yeah. You know everybody can probably guess what that is, and it's a good tire. Um, and what I, my experience with the uh, the Kenda is that it's every bit as good as that tire. Yeah. Except it's quieter. Mm, um, that's huge huge especially in an right, older car right. where it's already making enough noise <laughs> um, and it gives up nothing um on the trail gives up absolutely nothing and it's and it's cheaper uh, and I, I that's actually i don't like using the word cheaper because it implies right. something negative it's um it costs less and performs the same or better so if it were any other part it's a no-brainer so um, and to be uh, like, let's be transparent. I did yeah. not ask you to p- plug no. Kenda, right? And no. that's been my experience too. And every customer I've suggested them to, like, we just believe in that tire now. Yeah. I don't say that about every one of their tires, like, but that Cleaver RT is a home run. Yeah. And what's exciting this year um, at SEMA, they introduced their new Cleaver AT, complete yeah. redesign. I think it's one of the few ATs that has like the snow rating. Oh, that's cool. Like, yeah. We don't have to worry about that here right, in Phoenix. In Phoenix. Uh, um, well, then we get some snow, but just not not yeah. like you get snow. That's true. Um, so yeah, super stoked to see that kind of hit the market this spring. Yeah. And uh and put it on a on a few trucks. It is yeah. I think for more like the daily driver, like more ro- on road light yeah. trail, whereas like the RT I think is more like fifty fifty. Yeah, I agree. Like I wouldn't put um uh, if I had the choice, right? I wouldn't put the R the yeah, the R T on a on a truck that um is primarily an on-road, you know, yeah. certainly not on a daily driver. Not not because of anything other than you're just going to wear out a tire right. that's not meant to do that's that. Right. Uh, you're going to you're going to take a lot of, of the of its life cycle out just by driving on the pavement. Um, but like if you had, okay, I have a, a, a suburban project that yes. I'm working on, and that that might be a perfect candidate for it. Like yeah, I, I'd exactly. say it's going to be a primarily on-road road tripper vehicle, but I want it to be able to. I want to be able to just. Go off road, and let's talk about and, this and do, and not worry about. Oh, geez, do I have the right gear on the truck? You know, yeah. Like, I, I think that's a good candidate for it. Yes, perfect. And they have like to, they'll have like E and D, like to just tow rated tires. For, yeah, for also that. big on that. Um, yeah, but real quick, so yes, do you tell us about the suburban really fast? Um, I'm a, It's a. It's kind of like a. Uh, if anybody's seen the talented Mr. Ripley, um, I would be the Matt uh, the Matt Damon character in that. <laughs> yeah. As um, Sean has a. Um, a really sweet uh, mid eighties. I don't know what Not, year. Mine's a ninety one. Yours is ninety one. Oh, so it's Which okay. So it's laid in that square body. It's the last, the last one in the square body yeah. era. And I've, I've always been between Ford and Chevy. I'm, I'm decidedly a Ford guy, more by accident. There's no, there's no real hate there. But right. in any case, I, I don't have a lot of experience with uh, Chevy projects or products. Um, and I saw your, your suburban, how you were using it, like. Like it was a workhorse, but also yeah, we mobbed that know, thing. To, yes, like I've 
I was introduced to seeing Sean just like use it as a tow, just just working it as a full on heavy duty tow vehicle, and it was kicking butt. Um, and that may, I've got two little kids, yes. and you know I want them it's to cool, have man. road trip experience and stuff yeah. like that. And and it's it's cavernous it's in there, huge. <laughs> and I, it's all, but it's also comfortable. Like yeah, if, it's super if I got a seventy three suburban, which I actually think are maybe cooler appearance yeah, right. wise and have this kind of a much cooler vibe to them. I don't think my when my two little girls get to be four and six years old or whatever, they're going to be right. in this, and it's going to be like roughing it, really. Yeah, right. And I don't want them to rough it. I want them, want, want them to be comfortable and not want them. What year is yours? It is 87. 87. Okay, cool. So that was, I think, the first year of fuel injection. Yeah, TBI. But it, it was, it was the, it had a 700R4, yeah, not the okay. 4L60E. Okay. So it's a manual, you know, the, the more manual mechanical. And you are putting a 60, yes. 6L80. A 6L80 out of a. 2018 um, GM Savannah cargo van. Yes. Which, if folks don't know, that's actually a really beastly it is. work vehicle. And are you going to keep the MP240? Oh, no, that's an MP208. Yes, it had a 208. So you're, you got to kind of do yeah. something. I don't think you can do an input shaft swap on that 208. Uh, you I didn't probably even think can. about yeah, it. Yeah, they're not great. I, because I wanted a gear driven case. Yeah. Um, so you're going with Atlas? No, I, I'm also trying to do it more on a budget than okay, I than okay. I would have done yep. our scout projects, um, and um, that helped me justify it to my oh, wife. Oh, two hundred five, a two hundred five, sick. So they yeah they use two hundred fives on the heavy yeah. heavier duty suburbans. Perfect. Mine's uh, is a half ton suburban, but the, really the only difference is the rear end axle and some dual shocks and the transfer case. Right. Uh, there's, there's it's not a different frame or anything, so um, I'll always be able to put a, a more heavy duty axle in it if I wanted Easy. to. Um, and yeah, I found a I found a two oh five, I think on on Craigslist for like two hundred dollars. Sweet. It was gonna have to I I would have rebuilt it regardless of the condition right. and got the got the kit, the the little all the, the little adapter um, yeah. parts from to go advanced to a thirty two spline. Yeah, easy. Yes. That's yes. great, great choice. Um Will you go, because this is a debate I've been having, mine has 16-inch wheels, yeah, which limits me in the Kenda yeah. um, lineup, but I really want, I want to keep it stock looking, I but I also want 17s because the world opens up to you with tires. <sighs> yeah, I'm admittedly undecided. I think that's the hardest. I think people, I think rims and tires are the hardest decision to make on uh, older vehicles where um, where they're, if they're not 17s, right? If we're talking about trucks where it's not 17s, and and that's where most modern vehicles, Jeeps, and, right? And what and are yours? Yours is a 1500, so it would have had 15s on it, right? I th can't remember if it's 15s or 16s. It's I know it's not 17s. They're so limited, man, with tire size. Very limited. What about those 1552 analog HDs? I love them. That's what I might put them on. I love them. Um, I've they're just spendy. Yeah. And, but That's I mean, they're out, but I mean, any new rim is kind right. of spinning. Right. So, um, I don't know. I got to figure out what you got to, what I think most people don't realize with rims and tires is, is when you make a decision on, a, on rims and tires, first of all, you have to make rim and tire decisions together. Yes. Don't make them separately. Um, but you're also kind of deciding, um, ride height, exactly. lift, spring, Basically, your whole suspension and brake package, axle ratio, at, yes, I mean, all that stuff is. So it's not when you're doing it, you've really got to contemplate what other changes you're going to have to make in relatively short order. You don't have to make them all at the same time, but like you can't string that out. I don't think you can or should right. string that out over five years. I mean, that's a. I think you need to handle all that within eighteen months and get to where you where you want to be, or else you're just going to find yourself unhappy with this thing you right. probably put some money into. And yeah. um, I think people just jump really quick on rims and tires, but then they they're like, "Oh, geez, I didn't know I'd," I, like, okay, we see it all the time. Because I want to put a locker in the suburban ultimately, but I'm holding off because I don't know what gear ratio and final rim and tire I'm going right. to have, and so there's no point in messing around with the differential. Right. I don't want to buy have to buy lockers twice. Right. I mean, that would be a. I think kind of suburban, like day. a square body suburban. Stock, stock to two inch lift max. I think max. Max, right? And um, a thirty three ten five. Is, okay. To scale is that's like pretty what's on perfect. it right now. It is okay. It, and it does. It, the rear's lift. It's weird. The rear has like. So I bought it um, maybe uh, nine months ago from a dude in Colorado. Really, really good guy. It was a one of those transactions that makes you feel like you did a good thing afterward, and. Um, he he had had put 
33, 10 and a half. And then, okay. um, but so the rear has like a little block in there. Yep. The front doesn't. So on that vehicle, it's hard to tell, but it actually has a small rake, yep. slight rake to it. That you like that? I don't even know. No. Right. I want my vehicles flat. Same. Flat, flat, flat. Um, or if you had to choose, uh, I'm a slight like Baja, just a little bit. Just, really? Yeah. I don't. I, rather than raked, I don't like raked. Yeah. Rakes. It, 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 I don't. I don't like. Again, I'm not a hater. If if people like that, but it's just it's just not my thing. I want it. I I come from a perspective of, you know, racing being kind of like the mm -hmm. the the top of every mountain is what would the race equivalent of this mm -hmm. car be or co competitive equivalent and. I can't think of many vehicles that have a have a that are not level for a competitive reason. <laughs> That's so right. So I I just it seems it doesn't come to me naturally. But okay, so yeah, fun suburban discussion. Awesome. I'm excited to see that come together. And the base camp bourbon is I just it's down for the count for not for the count for now. For I now. repainted the roof because all the, oh, the yeah. clear coat on those Chevys like yes, yeah. it's, it's like happens to all of them. That's like peeling off the roof. Yeah. Down to like the epoxy primer or whatever. So repainted yeah. the roof. Got to do it. Had a little, I think I talked about it on the show. Had a little accident with my boat in the oh, rear. Yeah. yeah. Barn doors. Yours is a tailgate, right? No, I have barn doors. Oh, sick. Love it. Love it. Um, so awesome. New windshields. My windshield was cracked. Oh, okay. And it was nice to paint in there anyway. Yeah. So I hated painting it because mine's original paint, but yeah. like, what are you going to do? Yeah. You, at that you point, have you have to. to. Um, and then I do, so I have a six liter 4L80. Yeah. And I'm strongly contemplating an, a Gen 5, like an L86, 8L90. Whoa. Okay. It's an eight speed. Yeah. Um, just because we want to experiment with it at, the, at yeah. the, the business. And it's a perfect, just when you're towing and hauling in grades, like the more you gears, be the, right gear. the more gears, the better. Okay. So we digress away from the Suburbans. Um, so first, we're going to talk about a couple of questions, okay. and we'll use a couple of your vehicles as case studies, because I feel like they Great. represent, number one, a lot of people can relate to one of these projects. Yeah. And number two, they're just interesting stories, and you've learned over time, and they're different. So we're going to talk about what you see here is the Scout 2, which you've had the, long, the longest out of the three or four vehicles that we'll talk about, right? Um, I might have had... It's close. We're splitting hairs here, but I might have had the, this yellow car okay. longer. But um, I've had both for over 10 years. Yes. At least. At least, yeah. I think it's, yeah, yeah, Easy, maybe. Easily. I'm Easy. Probably 05 is when I got this. Yes, that makes sense. 506. Because I, I moved to Iowa in o, end, end of 06, 07, and I definitely remember talking to you oh, in okay. California, which okay. was, it would have been 05. Yeah, okay, that's, that's interesting. That's, that's cool. Didn't know that. And that's 15 years now, buddy. Isn't that crazy? That, that's nuts. <laughs> um, Feeling old. So you got this scout. Yeah. Interesting journey on that. You have your orange legend, patina legend series, Scout 800, yep. which has a different kind of, you approached it completely different. Very different. And then we have, what year is your F-250? I have a, a, a uh, it's not in the in our camera shot here, but it's a 1970 F-250 Crew cab, short bed, two wheel drive. Very sick truck. Very sick. Yeah. And very, for, for F100 nuts, which I'm like on the outside looking in on that. Um, but for people who are real purists, it's like, you know, it's either a Pegasus or a unicorn. It's, really? I don't know if it's, a, if it's a, the, the winged unicorn, but, okay. it's, but it's people will stop and gawk at it. And it's, it's a most very people patina see, truck. You yes. Know? Which is awesome. My yeah, favorite. Me and too. to get that, like probably a lot of guys shorten long bed. Like, oh yeah. Like, but this is a true oh, short yeah. bed. The big thing I guess is the cab that all those, a, a, a crew cab with four doors right. back then was like a full custom Interesting. order where they'd pull it off the line wow. and they had like, you know, they had one or one shop that would fabricate them by hand. It's crazy. With, you know, yeah, with Ford shell, four body. So we'll show parts. some pics, but that one, is also different. So let's just start, and then we'll talk about this if we have time. The talk Boss the three, the Boss three hundred two. Sweet. What, what year is seventy? Seventy. Seventy. Great also car. 70. Um, okay, so the three questions we're going to kind of tool around with, and we'll use these four projects to talk around these questions. Is um, how do you determine should you leave it alone? Yeah. Should you modify? Um, the second question 
then is like, what are the consequences of leaving it alone or modifying? So it's kind of the yeah. pros and cons. Yeah. Is there a point where you modify it? Because I've, I've personally lived this and seen this. When you modify it so much for your intended dream uh -huh. or purpose, and then you go, I should have left it alone. I enjoyed it more yeah. back when it was original yeah. or whatever, um, or slightly modified. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to talk about in that same discussion, when do you just swap it to a modern? Yes. Like a, yes. like an LS conversion or modern engine swap. Yeah. So let's kind of just start that, that. What was your journey on the scout to give us the, the yeah. 15 years and a couple it, minutes? A, a little bit mirrors my, like my personal journey in general about like attitude towards cars and car projects mm -hmm. and, and what, what's the role of, of the car hobby in my life? Like, why am I, what's, what's driving the passion behind it all? Um, I bought it ironically enough because I was looking for a convertible. I didn't own a convertible really? and I wanted okay. an open air car <laughs> and I was riffing with a buddy at work about it. And he said, Oh, well, you should buy my scout. And I said, y you, did you not hear me? I wanted a convertible. And he's, he's like, the top comes off. And I was like, yeah, but oh yeah, that's kind of cool. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm always drawn towards ugly ducklings or, yes. um, you know, cart like it's more unique it's way more unique you know i i love the international um scouts because they're not broncos and they're not blazers and That's now right. i would say they're not fjs either you know what i mean yeah so um um i think that there's a, and it has a distinct character to it yeah you know, absolutely which is, which is a more midwest vibe than a straight detroit vibe mm -hmm, all, all that mm -hmm. cool stuff so um bought it for twenty eight hundred dollars it was all original we were talking about this last night um Sean, Sean's opinion is way better than mine. In the, the condition I bought it in, we, today would sell for $28,000, yeah. you said. Because it's got like zero rust. It was, yeah, it was a zero rust car. And it's and all it's original. Totally. And the patina is just awesome. The patina like is, is dead, dead nuts perfect. <laughs> Sorry if that, if <laughs> no, that offends No, that's perfect. It, it was right on, like, like, um, like you know that t-shirt that's so worn out? Yes. That it's, it's not perforated yet, but it's like semi-transparent. But yeah. It, it feels so good and your wife hates it. Yes. That's the level of patina yeah. that was on this thing. Uh, and that's what I meant with the values. Like, cause there's some patina that's just like two, like original patina trucks. Like you have like just beautiful, been in a yeah. heated storage facility its whole life and it looks brand new. That's time capsule. Time capsule. That's yeah. good, good word. But then you have like the time capsules that have been driven and out a little bit. And they just have this really rad character. Right. That's kind of, I think, right. probably both of our sweet spots. Like Amen. Where we love them. Amen. But then they start to get like so patinaed and then they start to get yeah. like, like rust Like only holes. a mother could love it. Yeah. You know. And the value just. Like almost like like a, like a pre-terrible. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Until you get to where it's just like, no, it's not cool anymore. Yeah. It's just too, or like in faux, I, I'm, I'm, some people, we could, we could debate this at different podcast. Yeah. But the faux, faux tina stuff. But this is the real <laughs> yeah. deal stuff. So you, yeah. you bought this truck. Yep. Um, and I didn't have a real specific purpose with it, right? Because I was, I kind of wanted to fill this convertible niche, and um, I knew very little about the car, mm -hmm. very little. Uh, you know, did some Wikipedia research, yeah. So I, I didn't feel like a complete ignoramus, and then, then just started driving it. And did you start? Did you have much off-road experience? I did. Okay. So I grew up. Um, I always like went to school in Phoenix, but there was times growing up in, in my life, like I, I um, lived in in different, more places than the average kid because like my parents got divorced. So, so not, it was not like a latchkey bounce around kid. Not, that's not my story. But, but the point is that for several years, um, we lived like kind of like in the boonies. Yep. Um, where like literally off the highway and on the weekends, Actually, it's awesome. My dad um, somehow got brought this Japanese market. Um, he didn't bring it over, but he found it and bought it. This like Japanese market, nineteen seventy, early seventies Suzuki Is Samurai that the one precursor. That's over there? Yeah, yeah, I think so. It's awesome. It's awesome. It's a two stroke, right? Two stroke, three cylinder, two stroke, liquid <laughs> so cool. cool, water cool, so cool. It's rad. The engine's like this big. <laughs> yeah, the whole thing, um, and it's a manual transmission. And I, my brother and I, learned how to drive in that car That's and we, awesome. we could basically just drive, we'd wait till there were no cars in the highway, drive up and over the highway across the road. We called it going across the road. 
and <clears throat> the it was this off-roading paradise of all this various skill levels. You could, wow. sp- you could spend all day over that's there. That's so cool. And we did. Yeah. Um, yeah, Is that's this totally like pre sixteen or oh yeah, I was like eleven and twelve years old. What? <laughs> that's awesome. Man. It was. I can't, you know, one of, one of the, I'm Arizona sure we all have this cool things. like that. It is. It totally is. And it was a spot where like on the weekends there'd be, you know, like it was a popular kind of car camping spot. Okay. Um, but during the week, you know, it was you like, it was totally to ourselves. That's so, awesome. Is it still open land today? For the most part, it's harder to get back there yeah. now because they redid the highway and some stuff. Oh, but, that's um, right. But yeah, you could basically do that same stuff. Arizona and, is really good that way. And then you... Outside of that vehicle, you your car passion started more with cars for sure. Sports okay. cars and, yeah. and and muscle cars yes. on pavement, like probably like a lot of you know sixteen to twenty four males. You know, it starts becoming about horsepower and speed and you know whatever. Right. Try to be a modern day Fonzie. Yes, and um, and we'll talk about that. We're gonna do another episode with Stu about like just what drives like what creates and drives car guys because it's yeah car people yes because it's definitely a thing yes and there's like car people it's just like there's like dog people and not dog people yeah it's like that with cars so let's let's save that back because i want to hear that backstory so so anyway you get this so get this and this was kind of like after i had kind of like probably um take like taking a first sigh of relief after just being really obsessed with going fast and horsepower and Mm -hmm. smoking tires and stuff Mm -hmm. Um, I started appreciating the value of, of just cruising more and, you know, stop, literally stopping and smelling the roses. And it has, a th- it had a 304. 304. Auto? Auto. Auto, okay. Um, Poo- kind of poochy. Yeah. But did you enjoy driving it as is? I did. It felt, um, I was, so I already liked old cars. Yeah. But I, I, I so I, I got a lot out of it in that department. Um, I really dug just the vibe of the car. Like the interior was has like uh, is like um, is slash was like a velour kind of yes, greenish like green velour, velour, yeah, with some br- uh, brown um, you know faux leather vinyl. Just it you know again not a, you wouldn't see it in a Ford or Chevy, and I I was just really digging that. Yeah, um, it's awesome. And yeah, so um, you know I, I, as I look back on it I also probably right around that time I had read the John Steinbeck book Travels with Charlie yeah which might have been the very last book I've ever read um, <laughs> I don't try to I'm not trying to convey how many I'm, I'm yeah. the, the reader of the of the group but um, that was that story that book really appealed to me mm-hmm. and I I think I was connecting with something yeah that, that that if that book appeals to anybody that that it was connecting with some of those those things and I was exploring that part of whatever. So, so what started your modification pathway? So it really was when I went on an off-road trip. There's a really popular off-roading trail in in Arizona called uh, Crown. It's, it's referred to as Crown King. I'm going to Crown King. So Crown King is this like little tiny, tiny, tiny town or cluster of civilization that I think you can only access via dirt wow. roads. And they're not easy dirt roads. Um, so... Like you couldn't just take your your passenger car. Right. If you took your if you had a Tahoe, did it like a brand new Tahoe, you could do it, but you'd be like, I'm probably gonna scratch it up a little bit. Okay. So uh, different people have come down differently on that. But um, I went to Crown King, and and it was bone stock. Yes. And I had pre when I bought the truck, it had um, a two barrel carburetor on mm-hmm. it, and it was really slow. And I asked my I, I still can't tune a carburetor, but I asked my buddies that knew how to tune a carburetor. I'm like, can you look at this? Why is it so slow? And they found it only only one of the barrels was was really interesting flowing. Just, yeah, and then and then the throttle was was stuck at halfway. So I was getting I was only getting half throttle and and half of my right. carburetor. So it was really slow, and it was that woke it up. And so then I was like, oh okay, I'm on. I can do this now. Right. So I go do this trip to Crown King, and it had. Uh, stock springs and shocks, and I think they were stock, but it basically had a helper spring in the rear, yep. you know, a real super stiff leaf. And I've rattled the crap out of my myself. Uh, like it was one of those four hour trips out and back. Yep. You know, because they have like a, a really good like burger joint restaurant kind of place that's worth going to. That's why you'd that's go to Crown King. Really? Go for the restaurant. That's only accessible on these dirt roads. Yeah, it's cool. That's wild. It's really cool. Is it still a thing? For sure. Let's do it. Let's do it. I got to do it. Uh, That's awesome. Much better in, in how it is now than before. Right. But it was one of those trips where you get back and the next day, you like you feel like you did a, you had like an ab workout. Yeah. Like you're like, oh. And you're peeing blood. <laughs> Not that bad, <laughs> but close. Yeah. And and I realized, you know, 
if I wanted to have, you know, live out my off-road dreams on this thing, it's got to, I got to get it more capable. Yes. And so I started. Which is just really quick. Cause yeah. That, Cause that is. That was the basis. You're just hitting on the first, I think, core principle is what do you want? Sometimes you don't realize what you want to do until you get the vehicle. Yes. Like it's like getting a yes. car and you go road racing and go, that was amazing. Or you yeah. go auto crossing or rally crossing. So you got this went off road. Yeah. You're like, so now you start to establish a vision. And can I say that, like, would, would this be right? Like the, the vision became more practical than sentimental or like, yes. like in your hierarchy of things it was yes. not like, I want to preserve this as a time capsule for correct. No, I want to use it. So, so correct. That's, that's a uh, key. So you hit on now I want to, uh, that was so awesome. Yeah. I want to make it a little more capable. Yeah. So then what, what did you start attacking? Um, I started attacking um, ride, the, just basically ride quality. Yep. Um, I, so it was an XLC. Mm -hmm. So I knew that I had um, above average, if not better axles for what I was doing. Mm -hmm. Right. I wasn't, I knew I was never going to be king of the hammers. Right. Right. Baja 1000. Right. Which is you know, key to that. I vision. like slow crawling over big rocks. Okay. And, and, just taking your time. Um, and so I knew I, my axles were good. Yep. Um, so then it was springs and shocks. And then I, that's really, I started learning more about springs and shocks for off-road stuff than I did on-road. Interesting. And I, you know, and I, I started trying to read more on the internet about leafs versus coil springs and um, how to get the most out of leaf mm -hmm. springs and, um, uh, and then shocks and how do shocks work and you know what's a monotube shock what's a gas shock and right. you know I knew nothing I knew nothing and so I started to realize that there was some some tech that uh, I could I could improve the vehicle with and this was important to me much more at the time than it than it is now I, I very much have a bias towards um, leaving originality in and favoring right or, you know. The, the stuff the car came with. Right. Um, it's not so much for a purist reason of um, there's like some sacred cow that right. you have to you have to bow down before. Is it like, but they engineered it like that for a reason. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and I think people should be, I would advise anybody um, trying to figure this out for themselves that um, when you do a lot of these, these upgrades or you make it a little more modern, it's, um, oftentimes impossible to go back or very difficult yes, to go backwards. Right. And so I think, um, I think you, it, you, you want to be a, a, just drag your foot. I don't know the, the analogy, but like on, on, when you, if you're contemplating doing that to first put your toe in the, the water, then put your foot, then put your ankle, then put your calf. Got it. Right. That's um, very good advice. I would not, I would do it incrementally one aspect at a time. And at each point, See what you like because That's good advice. I didn't want to. I had never really done an engine swap in a car of any kind before, and that was very intimidating to me. And the big thing was, and maybe this is just how I was brought up, but for whatever reason, I, I look at those decisions as what's wrong with it? Is it right. what is it not doing? Literally, you have to ask, what is it not doing that I want to do? Right. And I couldn't come up with a good answer to that question. Um, and the motor was original, you know what I mean? It wasn't yep. like somebody put a small block Chevy in it and that's what it, it had. It had its right. original 304 that basically worked. Um, but I, I knew my, my problem was, is that this truck is fine. It's just really uncomfortable and bounces a lot. Okay. And, you know, I couldn't take my girlfriend at the time. I'm married now, but I couldn't take my girlfriend in there. For, she wouldn't want to roll like that for very long. So... Is the because and this is what I like. My favorite thing about this truck is the details and the restraint, in my opinion, because yeah. it is restrained. Like, yeah, I love that, and it's subtle. And yeah, but like, is what what leaves? So you tackled suspension. Is this yeah. suspension what you came up with? It is. Wow. So that's it is. good. That that means you did it right. Because a lot of dudes are like, we run into this all the time. Yeah. They want a, uh, a lift to put bigger tires for better clearance, yeah, better ride quality. So they go out and buy a four-inch lift, not realizing that the four-inch lifts don't ride very; like they, they ride Dude. terrible. Um, so I, they, if you want to have a podcast called "Don't Lift That Truck," I'm your guy. <laughs> That's right. I'm your guy. So, but you did lift this truck, 
but it's 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 very minimal. It, yeah, it's it was. The, I think the only reason to lift a a truck is to make accommodations for tires. The reason behind the t- those tires is because the tires that are on it aren't doing what you want it to do. Right. I I am I expressly frown on just getting it up in the air. Totally. I think that that's. And let's just not a, not a good long term. Good. Uh, we might run out of time and do this in a two parter. Okay. Um, but bigger tires, because there is people think of larger tires as only clearance. Right. But one thing you've we you and I have talked about for like more than minutes yeah. is like the way that tires help ride quality off, particularly off road with time. lower tire pressure. So getting a little more rubber. Big time. This influences rim size. This influences all those kinds yeah. of things. Yeah. So um, my viewpoint on that on trucks um, that are going to see some off road are that the single biggest way to improve your ride ride quality on the trail is to lower your tire pressure. Mm-hmm. You can spend thousands, if not tens of thousands, on springs and shocks and rims and tires. And none of that, right? And I have I'm I'm a nerdy shot guy, but none of that will do as much as lowering your tires to 15 psi. Yep. So that's the first best thing. So and that that worked because you're taking a firm balloon and making it a not firm balloon right. and having adding a lot of give to that. It's there's a rock and your tire will just go conform around the yep. rock instead of just sitting proud on it and making the vehicle move instead. Right. Um, so did you determine at that time, like, I want a 33? I like, didn't. That's my, okay. I, what I realized was, I, I said, how, what's, what's the, I, I, I had, I can't remember, I think there were 30s yeah. that I bought it with. And I can't remember if that was, that's OE spec or not, but they were, they were small because when I went on the deck Crown King run, I was hitting things. Totally. Like you're mashing the U-bolt. Yes. And the U-bolt plates yes. probably nonstop. That's, and again, that's the reason to go bigger to get bigger tires y'all is because the tires you have now things are hitting your axles or other components of your vehicle that you don't want to have happen so if you're not so i have like i have a a little brother um and who's in high school and he's like yeah i want to get these big tires i want to jack up he has a he has like a a fj cruiser yeah and i'm um cardi if you're listening i love you but (laughs) i'm like i'm always telling like why why are you are you going off-road and hitting things then no, then you don't need to do it. Because it does destroy, like... It changes everything. It changes it. Like, you have fuel to now economy go through it the whole... now yes. stinks. Like, yes. the steering quality is yeah. worse. Like, yeah. So I I, um, I knew I needed bigger, but I didn't... I also didn't want to, like, have to need a ladder to get in the right. in truck. So 33s were perfect. I made the truck um, clear the, the wheel wells enough, but no more yep. than that. Um, and just uh, while we're on the Scout topic, a 33 is pretty much the biggest tire you can you can put on a scout without rubbing sheet yes. metal and like yeah. cutting sheet metal. And that is I've, a huge decision. After, after that, if anybody still is like, yeah, but still Sean, I need a 34 or 35. I do meet mild, um, you know, non, non powder puff off-roading. I don't, I'm not doing extreme grot crawling, but right. I do, I do stuff that's not, not just powder puff stuff. And I've never had a problem with And I would say like what, this, the stuff you're doing is on the extreme end of like overlanding, like okay. vibe, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like it's not hardcore rock crawling, right? But it's definitely not not rock yeah. crawling. It's like chill, pretty easy stuff all day with with Technical. one or two real interesting sections right. that are ten minutes max in length. But you yeah. know, you got to get through them to yeah. get where you want to go. Okay, so you did some great research. What yeah. brand are those springs? Deaver. Deaver. I'm a big guy, non paid cool. endorser of Deaver. I think it's D E A V E R. Yep. I. I read a lot, and everything seemed to point to Deaver making the best uh, ride quality leaf spring for off roading. And one of the things that uh, is is anybody could do it, but if you look at a Deaver spring versus the, the st- springs that they replaced, right? You know, they were like it was like a three or four leaf spring, and these have like, dude, they have, these things are it's like thick. eight leaf or nine yeah. leaf, which is I, they comp- they on the phone when I was talking to the Deaver folks, they the they gave me a, a illustration that I assume, I, I believe made sense to me, and I tell people when I try to talk to them about these springs, it's it's like going the wheel travel, or the wheel articulation. Imagine comparing that to a staircase. You got to get upstairs. The wheel has to travel a certain distance somehow, um, up and down. Um, the smoothness of that travel that translates to the driver 
is you can think of it as more leaves, just like having more steps on a staircase. Oh, yeah, to get to the second floor of your house or your wor- off workplace, do you want to get to the second floor on a staircase that has three stairs or that has 12 stairs? Well, 12 is going to be a lot easier and less jarring and disruptive to get right. up. And that's that's why you put leaves have uh, more, that have more leaves in your leaf and there's spring. like like are they tapered are there friction pads yeah. like there's a lot like a number yeah, we, then have, there's we, could do, we could do a whole podcast on yeah but i think whatever you technology. can read on the internet you, you know is yeah. as good as what i could i could advise and but. you did so you got those springs and did yep. you go to the king shocks at that point as well not at first okay i'm trying to remember the kings came after when um no, that's I'm wrong. No, the kings we did uh, kings and the and the leaves. Yeah, and then I I realized that I had some um, some steering and driveline questionable issues. Right, that I was getting close to you know bump steer issues. I didn't have like a high knuckle steer thing, and then and so I took it to a local guy that that hardcore off roaders will know a guy named Randy Ellis. Yep. Um, who has an awesome Instagram page called Simplify and Sale because he sold his shop and he's living the dream. He's sailing around the world. Really? Wow. It's awesome. That's awesome. Um, but Randy Ellis and his shop cut and turned um, the Another axles. key upgrade. Yep. And uh, beefed up the steering linkage. And that's where the Kings came from. Got it. Uh, Randy, uh, I had to modify the shock mounts for the yep. Kings. So you did suspension. Yeah. Now you're kind of happy. Like it's b- big improvement. Yeah. Um, and then, but you still have the 304. Yep. Still carbureted. Still car at the time it was still carbureted. And then had the 727. Yep. And a Dana 20. Yeah. Okay. So then, because this is to our question, like yeah. Um, Why is that not enough? Yeah, and like, because you. So you started down, and then a lot of scout guys in particular can relate to this. I I feel tons of phone calls and talk to a lot of guys who are like, I did all this stuff to my 345 or 304. Yeah. yeah. And it's and sometimes it's fine. In my in my experience, the more you do to them, the worse they kind of yeah. Get. The more disappointed you'll be. The more for disappointed. Sure. That's the better way to put it. Yeah. It's, um, you just can't. Uh, you, I I found, and I don't mean to short circuit you. You just can't upgrade your 304 enough. To make it not if it's not good enough as it is, <laughs> yeah. that thing that you want it to do, you just can't get it there. Um, and we're talking big. Did you rebuild your motor? I, I rebuilt it once. Did you ever do a cam or anything? No. Okay, so you that's smart. Yeah, I, I, yeah, no, I never. I'm did kind the of cam. a stock cam guy in IH motors personally. Like other people in the yeah. IH world, maybe know more than I do. But well, here's what I loved about the the 304 was that it. Um, in Arizona, you have a lot of overheating issues, mm-hmm. and that super heavy, a yeah. lot of dense, a lot of metal in that block on a 304, it would soak up heat. Excellent, you yeah, could dude, not overheat it. That's awesome. You could not overheat that thing, and that's a, that's a real issue, especially out on the trail in, in Arizona. So you, but first you upgraded the transmission. So you kept the 304. You fuel injected it, right? Yeah. So for for about a year or two. I put a Holley uh, Avenger throttle body. This is like okay. right when these throttle body fuel injections were taking off, like at the very early end of it. And that blew my mind. It did. That was a good thing. That is the only upgrade I would do okay. to a 304 okay. is I would put Holly, put, put any brand of fuel injection on it. And they now make, a lot of companies make, make two barrel. So if you have a 304 and you're like, oh, I need a four barrel this thing. You will get more performance and better, way better drivability out of a two-barrel EFI throttle body conversion than you will out of searching for that very hard-to-find four-barrel aluminum intake and putting right. a good four-barrel carburetor on it. Is that's in all situations, but it's on-road and off-road, but especially off-road. And that's why I did the the, yes, the EFI was because I took another off-roading trip with my family. Like we did this, this we have a, kind of like an annual trip. That we try to do and um it was dude it was me and like six razors <laughs> me and the scout trying <laughs> yeah. to follow six right killer so razors like, now we're talking steeper inclines yes declines side angles it was i, w- I was on the edge of my seat the whole time yep and the, my bench seat the whole time mm-hmm. and that um that was hairy and like everybody in my family was like dude you killed it i can't believe you followed us and I, but I was sweating bolts the whole time. And one in one instance in particular, there was a uphill climb that was really 
rocky and bouncy. And I stalled on it like three times with the carburetor. Which and can be dangerous. Yes. I don't think people appreciate that. If you're in a group and you stall, especially if I have an automatic at least, but especially if you have a manual. Right. And you're so trying to drive and manage the carburetor, which means basically you you've got to keep the RPM is higher than you want. So right. now you're hard charging and up this hill. That's right. Now you're risking, are you going to break the vehicle because you're going right. to hard charge into a big rock uphill just so you don't stall because you don't want to have to try to start it and then engage right. the clutch into first gear. Like it's just a lot going on and why are you doing it? If you're, if you're going to be doing this stuff, why are you putting yourself in this situation? Right. So then, so you decided fuel injection, yes. nice upgrade. Then what did you, you did something to the trans, right? Then I had... Yeah, but that's when that's when I really like started to cry uncle and got you involved. Mm. So I, I was again. I other than that, I didn't feel like I felt that the fuel injection upgrade was such a good upgrade um, for the off road capability that I needed and wanted. I didn't need a new engine. The three hundred four did it for me. I was as long as I wasn't in a hurry. Got it. I was always in good shape with that throttle body. So, but you went down the path. Didn't you do? A, I, you were doing a seven hundred R. Yeah. So I wanted. Okay. To, I wanted to put a overdrive, overdrive transmission in it because I uh, was. I would want to drive to a trail, and at you know, that transmission was like, full, and the engine was fully wound out. I was trying to preserve the engine. Plus, you did. You did eventually do gears. Once you landed the on the thirty three. The three. Yeah, I did. I did new gear. gear four rear tens. Gears. Probably. Okay. I probably. Think pro that sounds right. Because if you if, did you, if you needed like an overdrive, you were probably to yeah. get that better crawl ratio to go slow and controlled off road. Then you start to sacrifice your highway Absolutely. speed. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and I wanted to not have to sacrifice, have to pick low low range capability versus highway drivability. Right. And so um, I, I I knew I needed to get a four speed. If, if I was going to be able to do these things mm -hmm. still, because I, my plan was you're going to, the way you're going to save that engine long term is you're going to put an overdrive transmission on it. So when you drive for an hour and a half to right. a trail, you're not, you know, at 4,500 RPM exactly. the whole time. Exactly. So, um, cause that, those motors, the 304, it does not like RPM. No. So, um, so I, I got like, you know, I, I figured out what I thought was the right adapter kit. And then I, I got the, 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 the 727 out and I started to work it and it, and I realized I was having spline length and, sp and spline count and shaft length issues with my adapter kit. So I pick up the phone, I call anything scout. And that's when you and I started, um, you started giving me all this free advice. But you also like got down the road pretty far with that swap, right? I, I gave it everything I could. And I, what, what made me stop? I thought you, didn't you discover something was wrong with the motor? You know, no, I discovered I ordered the wrong transmission. Oh, I bought, oh that's right. I bought a, a, a rebuilt, um, I think it was a 700R4. Yeah, it had to have been because I didn't want it electronically controlled. I, right. I bought a rebuilt 700R4 from a dealership, like a Chevy dealership. And then I realized I got exactly what I ordered, but it had the wrong... Yeah. It was the wrong interface for the motor. Which is, again, like, so uh, to our discussion of modifying, like, that's what happens. You start now putting a Chevy transmission... Yep. And you were going to do an Atlas, I think, at the time. Yep. So you now you have three different brands of stuff. Yes. Coming together. Yes. And it's a recipe for fr frustration. And if you get it working, because I've lived this myself. I've done 700R four swaps behind IH Motors. Yeah. And it's like your hand making kick down brackets. Yeah. And it's like you're just. That's what gets you. That's and what gets it, you. And it also is what get. It is what gets you, but it also is what introduces one-off yeah stuff that starts to to hurt reliability yeah. and serviceability yes. so if you're out some rural place in arizona you can't just go to the auto parts store and big time. bail yourself out big time yeah i i'm i'm a big big proponent of you know don't don't go full custom unless you have a really re good reason to do so if especially if you've got just as um as good options that are you know standard or off the shelf and then, things people have already done before. So you loved the, the through you enjoyed the three hundred four. I did. Valued it, but then you decided, yeah. Through, and I liked. I honestly, I like being able to tell people, oh yeah, it's the original motor. I got a kick out of right. that, and that that meant something to me. Um, but I also started to go in this uh, this event called the Copper State Overland, which is like an off vintage off road rally, mm -hmm. which is you know kind of like a very amazing a event. niche nerdy nerdy event, but so 
freaking cool. Yeah. Um, and it's like a four day kind of uh, off road slash overlanding, whatever people, how they define that. But they, you know, you pay your, your, your fee and they, uh, that covers your hotel, your food. So literally all you got to do is show up and drive yep. and be at the meal times on time. So it's a really, really nice trip. Um, and I have a lot of friends that, do, that, that would go on that with me. So it was, it was aces all around, but, um, the, I, that's when I really, that's kind of what kicked me to needing that, got it, that transmission. So, and then you, so we, yeah, the discussion. So let's just, so you ended up doing an LS swap. Yeah. I went, went with the, went for the LS swap because, um, I was having reliability issues out on the trail. Um, and part of it was because like, like you were kind of bringing up, it's, I had an Atlas case. I, I wanted an Atlas case. I, I had my data 20 is what I had. Right. And that started like two years in a row. It failed me out on the trail. Yeah. Um, and that, that kind of was a sour memory on that for me. So I kind of just got so fed up that I was like, look, I need, I need a solution that is not, uh, not iffy. I need something right. that is absolutely, because if you have an iffy solution, but you're always nervous about what's the next thing that's going to break. Right. I, I, there's, I question the logic of that. I think that you have to over prepare for if you're doing trips like that. And I wanted to have a, I wanted to not worry about it, right. frankly. Yeah. So th that's when, and, and by that point, right, my frame, my shocks mounted differently to my frame. My springs mounted a little differently to my frame. Right. I had cut and turned axles. Uh, I had upsized tires. I already kind of broke the seal on, well, it's not original anymore. Right. And, um, and you did some really cool dash work. Like you had, you had yeah, some electronics. I had, I had some cool, yeah, like, yeah, really cool stuff. Yes. And so like that, the, the Rubicon got crossed there already. And um, I kind of was just tired of being that guy that was always limping to, be to the finish line. <laughs> yeah. And so um, you really gave me the confidence to do the LS swap. Yeah. And um, I, I'm extremely happy I did that. Extremely happy. It, yeah, that's interesting drivability you've had it on two two copper states with yeah. the ls yep and it's the motor i mean this it's this it, is what we always talk about dude. it's hard to f argue with technology like mm -hmm. they're so much more reliable yeah and not just because it's a modern engine but because and i say this as a as a really a ford guy it's the greatest engine ever built wow it's the ls engine um it's it's a to me it's like one step removed from putting men on the moon that they built this <laughs> engine it is it's a it it's is, a dude. it's a miracle and whenever you know people are looking forward to going to a fully electrification it's like can we just stop and appreciate what the ls engine has done it's had an incredible run yeah it has an inc it has still a, a ceiling that we haven't even seen on w power and efficiency yeah it's crazy um the reliability is insane the let there's that legendary you know whatever hot rod magazine article where they're like let's see how much psi we have to put boost this thing to break it and they couldn't break it yeah um it's a, it's 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 one of the great machines of the second half or of, of this 50 year period that we're yeah. in um it's simply incredible so um i went from being you know worst this is like worst to first on that hmm. event with the compared to the other vehicles in terms of reliability i went from the guy that might need to get pulled pulled to the sick bay area to no no i got you i'll pull you out yeah you know literally that's awesome um and i don't have i don't have a twenty thousand dollar crate motor lsa right like you've done those right and those are freaking right. awesome but i have a junkyard yeah a four four eight right or do i have a no five, it's three? a five three okay yeah. so i have a five three it's all the power you ever want i would actually i wouldn't want if you said like hey i could get you 100 more horsepower i'd say no i'm good right um it's just incredible. It drives like a like a modern Chevy pickup truck as far as the power right. and the that drivability aspect of it. It's awesome. And so on this particular truck, then you've done some like tasteful, like we, we just put a roll cage yep. in it. It's Taste been to Sean's twice. Yeah, it went there for the for the uh, swap, and then it went back for like the chair, a bunch of cherries on top. Because like what you discovered is now that it's like it's like mobbable on the yeah. copper, like off road. Yeah, you're driving it hard, and you were seeing like that the the top is like starting to crack itself yes. apart. It's like just the body's jostling. Yeah, now I can do all these things that I couldn't do before. And That's now right. I'm seeing the very next kind of bottleneck or right. shortcoming of the right. vehicle. Which really was 
like what I love about what you've done and everyone should take note of this. This is not like the eighth suspension you've put on it. Yeah, correct. That's great, man. Correct. You do the research, you take your time, you learn from experience, mm-hmm. do it once, do it right. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you just keep clicking away. Yeah. Um, like you said, you put, you put the toes in, the feet in, the, yeah. up to the waist. Yeah. So we put, I think, the, a cage in it, right? But it wasn't tied to the roof rack. Yeah, well, we had a roof, when we did the LS swap, you, that's when the that's roof right. rack. Okay, you put we, on, did, we just put one of our like kind of anything scout new legend yeah. roof racks. Yep. And that almost made it worse because there's a little more weight on the roof. I think so. Um, so then we did a full cage and tied the cage into the roof rack. Yes. Did that help? Helped uh, tremendously. Yeah. And um, full disclosure, even though I bought the car because I wanted a convertible, I never take the top off. Right. So especially in Arizona, I mean, it's beautiful here in the winter. Yeah, there's but, good times, but it's just I, I'm just not. Right. I'm too so lazy work. to, to yeah. yank it off. It's uh, I, I full, you know, I gotta admit that. But um, so yeah, so it, so it it was not an issue for me. Like, oh well, if you tie in the the cage to your roof rack, that means it like goes through the roof, and that's right. Now to take your roof off, it's a major deal, and maybe right. your cage looks funny. It's still it possible. Tabs. It's, it's still possible, but yeah. So I'm I'm I'm. It suits exactly what I need and want to get out of the vehicle. And the big question. Yeah. Do you feel like it's it's right it's done? I think I think it's yeah. I if I follow my own rules, yes, it's done. It because it does everything I want it That's to do. Awesome. It does nothing that I don't want it to do. Yeah, it um, looks it just looks amazing. It's like everything in my opinion, it's yeah. like the if, per, it's one of the most perfect like leaf sprung kind of old school new school blend thank you of vehicles yeah I th- that exists i think that we're definitely done with the drivetrain we're very likely done with like chassis suspension stuff yeah um if it had shortcomings now and i don't think they're big enough to to motivate to do it spend a bunch of money or time to go and and, and down the vehicle that's the other thing is you, right. when you do these things you down your vehicle for a long time yeah um it still has the original drum brakes in the rear in the, in the yeah in the rear which I've I've warmed those up real good uh, mm-hmm. at times and got me pretty nervous. But they stopped the car great. Yeah. I'm a, actually I'm a very pro drum brake guy, um, except like on water cross. If you, you yeah. get them wet, yep, they just stay wet longer and yeah. like and, go, and then back going down steep hills in reverse. Oh, they get a little sketchy. I, luckily, I've never done too much. But no, I, I, but yeah. So like the most the, the thing that now like now literally what I'm contemplating is uh, wiring. Yeah. improvements uh, interior improvements like Sean just helped me um, get some uh, really awesome Shieldman seats which are incredible are awesome they shout look- out to our friend Toby at Shieldman yeah um, and they just look awesome they like- look awesome they look correct in the car but they're yeah. also a modern seat I I'm sorry if I offend anybody I don't like those Mastercraft or Corbo right uh, off-road chunky no 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 you know they look like a pro touring seat right it's, I'm not I'm not down on it. It's just not my thing, and right. I just don't think it looks good in there. I agree, hundred percent. This this the, you got custom upholstery that is like almost a identical match. It is except for it, you put leather instead of the, the old vinyl. Right. Um. You, you Sean found the right material for it. Like their money and their their buckets instead of the bench because I was sliding around on the bench yeah, real which good. Is, it had to be big. It was you took you did Copper State with these new seats. Um, I let a buddy drive. It. Okay, because his, his, his rig like, died at the last minute, mm, so had to be has to be confidence inspiring versus like a so side hill on much. a bench seat, just like oh, oh my gosh, dude. I can just move it around. Huge difference. You were, I was sliding around big time on that on that bench seat. I, I mm-hmm. even I put three point harnesses in it to make it hold me down a little better, and it helped, but it was still pretty iffy. So um, okay, so well, let's do this. So we're we're fifty minutes in. Oh my god. So let's do this. Let's talk. Your other scout, yeah, and then when we do our second episode, we'll we'll continue this because okay. it's there's a lot of points in this, and we'll just maybe combine okay. a couple of things to talk about the Fords, the Fords. Yeah. Okay. So you had this journey with this truck. What inspired you to go? I want to scout 800. Yeah. So there are the I realize that there's some inherent limitations to the scout. Okay. There's Perfect. some things that it'll never ever do. Which I love, and this is like what what we're talking about restraint. Yeah, because you could have said next up coilovers yeah. and exactly and four that's link the big it. one was coilovers and four link, which you would know, do the my, same terrain but at twenty miles an hour faster. Yes. Okay. So this is a great point because, in my opinion, if you would do that, if you went to like an aftermarket 
Yeah. Or a desert. Like, I don't care how good a quality. Uh, well, that's, I guess if you go to like top suspension fabricator in the country, yeah. I'm sure they could get it pretty awesome. Like, yeah. Like I'll, I'll just, I, I, I have no shame saying it. Like, I think if you wanted to go full radical cost, no object, you would inquire with the guys at roadster shop and look at their chassis. But I don't think that's the thing to do. Right. I don't think it's the thing. Cause to I do. think it would like ruin this truck. I think it would. Yes, it would, it it's would so good right now. It would put it in, instead of being in like the high end, it's like, it's like right now the pluses on this thing are super high character. Um, does not look like a resto mod with, it still has this, that exactly. old vibe that if you like new legend stuff, that's what I'm talking about. This still has an, a, a, it's like a, would you call it a runner? Yeah, this would be like a, a like, runner of grade. Yeah. It's not a runner series, but it's, right. it's like a, it's at that grade sure. of truck. And um, if you like it that way, which I love it that way, then I think that if, if you did any more to it, you would punt it out of that categorization. That's right. And it would turn it into um, like a, a low end freak out build that someone right. was too cheap to put a paint job on. Right. Because you then you're like, I mean, you would pull it off. I believe in you, but like, you'd be like, but now we got to trim the fenders. Now, yes. now we got to do this. Yes. And then it just like becomes a race truck and it's not this like vintage, cool rig anymore. Yeah. And it okay. would probably cost upwards of 60 grand for the suspension to, do, right. to get there. Right. I'd throw, I have to throw away the money and the parts that I put on into Deaver it's, Springs exactly. and the King shocks, which I love. Um, there's nothing inherently wrong with them. So you decided against it, that. Path. Yeah. So you said, yeah. There's inherent limitations to this because I think it's really genius of like you're trying to make it what it's not. Uh, yeah, right. Which is like I get that. That's yeah. progress. It, it life. sounds so cheesy, but like be all you can be. Like yeah, I think it is all it can be. Yeah, and all it should be, and that's a good for thing. this vision. Yeah, right. Because if you have a different like, if you go like, no, I want to build a race truck, yes. a Baja one thousand race truck. Yeah, but I need to go build a race truck. I don't need to turn this. Try to turn that's this right. into that. So I I realized. Um, I'd like to have a scout that did more um, or that I could do that was that was more or some way different that um, yeah that was that that I could take everything I learned in the process of this yeah. and um, and leverage it and to another project yep so so you bought this like not quite as cool because it was repainted but yeah. super cool his scout 800 which is um what I love about it, it's like a 1970. 70. And what's cool is on like the dash, Yeah. you have like off-road rally little decals, yeah. like these metal decals from 1970 and 71 and 72. So yes. someone bought this thing and like- Brand new, brand out of the new, gate, showroom. And took it on these like yeah. really cool 70s it's, wheeling there's, events. Um, if anybody is old school and in, in the area enough, they might know it. I was not born yet, but in 19, they had 1970 and 1971 Arizona cinder rally. So there's an area up north in Arizona where it's like full volcanic cinders. Oh, wow. And it's so like everywhere as far as the eye can see. It's like sand dunes, but with cinders. Yeah. And um, there's like, there's a, there's a hill called $100 Hill, which if you can get it. up $100 Hill, somehow $100 <laughs> comes to you. I don't, I, I've right. never been up it, so I don't know. But, but it's, you know, it's like pseudo legendary. And it's like a big playground for off-roading. And so they must, someone must have had a big rally out there. And it's, it'd be like buying like a brand new Ford Raptor. And just going mo and, and going full guns with it yeah, right like away. the Mint 400. Yeah. Yeah. So it has two placards from that on the that, like these little metal dash placards. And then one from some San Diego Safari yeah. run. Um, so it's got some pedigree. Yeah. I and, love and I, that. And I loved it. And you were, you did have like a vision, like right at first, right? Like kind of maybe similar to this? Like I want to leave a lot of that old timey stuff. Yeah, I wanted to to have the same, from 50 feet away, I wanted people that, I basically wanted to have the same reaction to it. Yes. Um, people to react the same, like, hey, I love your old truck. But, yes. But I didn't want to have to, I wanted to go um, no constraints and have it be way more uh, modern and latest and greatest tech on it. Um, and I, I also learned that having a, having a, patina paint job and resisting the urge to paint it yeah. really made you feel um more positive about off-roading it right which is you know kind of a, a big chunk of the reason why for the car and you know if i had a new paint job 
maybe I would take it off road in the same places, maybe not. But as I'm going down the trail and I hear that scratch, yeah. I'm like, I'd be like, oh crap. Yeah. But in this, I'm like, Yahoo. You're right. And like, so your 800, like probably in the 80s, would you say 80s or 90s got like a repaint? Yeah, that look, that's probably right. And it had a lot of like, not a good repaint. High end. Like not rep- bad, but just whatever. Yeah, right. It's But it's, it's, it's complete. Fine. Yeah. And it had a lot of like what I would call high end home Yeah, shop, DIYer DIY stuff. DIYer type of fabrication yeah. and stuff like this. Crazy. But also somehow in its journey, it got a Chevy 350. Yes. And a weird, um, and just a funny story. I've said this, but Stuart was so gracious and in the, in the, we'll get to it, but the pathway of this truck ended up, we ended up not using, because it was weird. Like what we discovered when we got it at the shop. Yeah. I'm jumping ahead a little bit was, it's like, wait a minute. This, this has Jeep knuckles on it. Oh yeah. Like Wagoneer knuckles. Dude, and wait a that. minute. Yeah. This has a Jeep front axle. Wait a minute. It's got Jeep front leaf springs, stock rear leaf springs, a Chevy engine. Wait, it's a Ford transmission. It's got That's a, what that transmission was? Yeah. I never even knew that. And it's got a homemade... So I just had all this DIY... It was a patchwork yeah, quilt of... That I think yeah. we just determined like... This is... I remember talking to you like, I don't think we should build on this. Yeah. because So I, I called Sean and said, um, I want to do this um, vehicle. And I, and I was, again, calling, asking for free advice, which he had no, he had no reason. You could have just said, I'm not giving you free advice, bro. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I was, my, I was trying to decide, should I like hire someone local here to do like a full-on custom four-link, mm-hmm. custom yeah. frame, right. everything. And that's when Sean started telling yeah. me about well, let me tell you about, um, you know, I think you had a couple legend trucks done by then. Yep. And you just, you got your formula out to where it was truly a formula and not an experiment anymore. Right. And that's when we, that's when I decided, wait a second, I really should send it up to Sean instead of trying to job out various aspects yeah. of the build. So, okay. Yeah. So, and then we kind of went down the, so talk about that just a little bit more. Like, cause what we do at New Legend is we say we take the best of OE technology, and like best of OE design, yeah. R and D, all the things that are great from from the original equipment manufacturers, and we partner that with the best in the aftermarket, and then we get this repeatable, I like what you call it formula. Not it's not an experiment that gets repeatable results. Yeah, it's, gonna it's a recipe. Like, it's a recipe that goes like it drives great on road, great off road. Yeah. And here's like, it's a, it's a limitless platform. Yeah. So just to maybe talk a little bit on your decision process between that, because that was one vision. Totally. And the second vision was like, send it to some race car builder. And yeah. Do it. And I'm sure everybody in their town has either a, a knows a buddy or there's yes. a shop in town that um, is very competent to do, you know, to freak out and do a full custom four link, best of everything, you know, no you know, high end, no expense spared type of thing. And I think all my experiences together, um, I also don't in general, like I buy vehicles or I, I turn, undertake vehicle projects as long-term keepers. Yeah. Right. I'm not, I don't get tired of it in three years and then sell it right. and all that stuff, or, or I don't view it as investment opportunities. So, um, you know, I, having owned different vehicles for, for longer periods of time, you realize that, there's a premium to be put or something to be said for uh, serviceability. Yeah. Um, you know, I broke down just enough times, not broke down, but just had issues out on the road away from home in the tan scout here, the scout two, where I was like, I want to be able to go to any, whatever the auto parts store is in whatever town I'm at and have a very good chance of them having brake pads on the shelf. Right. Or the, I had, I lost an AC compressor, mm-hmm. having an AC compressor on the shelf. So, um, that was, um, that had a lot to do with basically steering me towards um, Sean's Outrigger chassis approach. Outrider. Oh, sorry, excuse me. Thank you. Yep, yep. Outrider chassis. Um, and I honestly had to be coaxed into it a little bit. Yeah. I mean, but what really got me was, I mean, dude, come on, if, bro. <laughs> if anybody's been in a, in a late mile Jeep, a Jeep right. JK, or right. I haven't even been to, no, I have been in a JL on road, but they're awesome. 
And I don't there's care. two million of them made. Yes. It's crazy. Um, and they're they're just awesome. Everything has been figured out on them. You have so many choices in the aftermarket for any aspect of that vehicle. And that's what you don't have. We well, you, thanks to you, you do have some choices now with your scout, but like when I bought that, it was a very right. much a smaller universe right. of how you could improve your scout or even forget about improving it, just keep it running, right. you know? And so, and I bet that has a little bit to do with why my Scout 800 came to you the way it did. Why did it have Jeep axles? Why did it right. have, exactly. because probably somebody was looking for something and couldn't find it. And they just, they had a buddy with a 350, they were swapping out and they, okay, yeah. fine. Like that's how you end up having a Frankenstein. Yeah. And just to finish that story, that, that frame, you graciously said like, Go for it, bro. Like so, that is the foundation of the Shenandoah. Yeah. So I've been, I'm very proud of that. To the tune of hundreds of hours, yes, like, have made it right. Like it had hand welded axle shafts, so it would have been a nightmare if you would have <laughs> like got it running That's and actually insane. took it on. Like someone, literally... I drove it on and off a trailer and in and out of my garage a few times, and it was scary. But yeah. I got the reason why I bought that truck was because I had been uh, scoping out Scout 800s for a long time. That's the other thing. I wanted 800 because I yeah. had it too. Um, finding a solid body. Dude, and it is solid. It's tough. You're good at that. Because it has zero rust on it. It's yeah. solid. And so I didn't care about the paint job. I just wanted a solid body where I wouldn't have to put time and money into fixing the body. And right. so that's why I got it. And I was like, if it runs, that's just a plus. You yeah. Know? So and it things barely ran. Yeah. So we did, we ended up going down the pathway of, of the chassis. Yep. You in typical Stuart fashion, we did a ton of research and we yeah. went with a long arm. Yes. Kind of smaller boutique suspension company. Yep. Which have you enjoyed the suspension ride and quality? I and, definitely have. Yeah. And um, probably more so on road than off road. Yeah. Which is crazy. That thing on road is a real joy. That's awesome. Um, especially on the highway the tan one after everything i've done to it is fine on the highway yes but it's not great um you know making a uh, it has the power to do passes but like you know coming in and out on a pass on a two-lane highway or um, a twisty road yeah you, you really do got to back off it yeah okay um and that's a little bit breaks um but also just the the whole setup with the 800 on the outrider it um it behaves so good like 85 miles an hour you don't even have to really think about that's awesome you know oh geez do i need to handle this differently than i would in a in a modern car and i so and i don't so it's great and then off-road it's it's um it's everything you want it to be i took it to again everything's got a limit so you right. can you can find that but um it's it's another level of I don't know whether it's, I, th I think it's more comfortable and just as capable as this thing, or if it's more capable. I, it's probably just equal capability, but way more comfortable yeah. going down the road right? Um, between the two trucks. And I wonder, like, if you got into some, like, real rocks, Yeah, I think you'd start to see that chassis i agree i like think if you got into a, real flexing situations yeah. where you, you know you got the front axle going one way and the rear going the other way there's no doubt i've got I'm, i'll be i'm in better position in the 800 right uh it's also i think more the, the body's more narrow hmm. I don't, i've never put a tape on the axle from think, tire to tire yeah they're probably pretty close that way but you feel just a little more nimble I, the wheelbase is shorter i assume in the 800 no same they're the same 100 yeah when I thought that, yeah, uh, but you feel more nimble. Yeah, you in, just feel more it. nimble. You know, like I agree. If you're going in a kind of weaving through some some bushes or where yeah. the road is like oh, really overgrown, yeah. um, I, the steering radius is or the turning radius is way better. Maybe that's why I think the wheelbase is shorter. Just the turning radius is yeah. It's it's like it's as good as a as a Jeep off the lot. Better. Yeah, yeah thank you. Yeah, we, we've done like Cause again because it's, it's it's like taking a Jeep off the lot and then going to the max with the aftermarket right. stuff. That's like awesome. We did. Better at like Dynatrack axles, yeah, not the, an experiment, dude. They got they're the best, yeah, like, they're just so dialed. Badass knuckles, the, um, the reed, yeah. Um, I don't even know what those are and called. The we reed did dude. some work, like, we had to do some work because you were uncompromising. Stuart was like pushing me, like, no, the steering's yeah. got it, but we're not maxing out the steering, yeah. We, so we, we, we ground ground down a little bit of, of, of some of the, the stops on the axle, but which again goes to like the same thing, even though it's like as engineered as you can get in the aftermarket. Yeah. 
it was still like you're putting reed knuckles on a Dynatrack housing. There was just yes. like you're putting mismatched yes. parts. And it, it's fine. And we got it figured out. Totally. But it's the same type of thing. Yep. Whereas like Rubicon axles out of the box. Yeah. You know that they're going to be seamless and get yeah. max turning. But 100%. Uh, but we, I feel like we got 100%. it great. Um, but then you you went a different uh, pathway. I think we talked about LS. We talked about like, because th- we obviously weren't going to use the 72... 120 no. horsepower, 350 no. that was burning oil. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you went a little different pathway. Talk about that. I was talking with one of my good friends that goes on that Copper State Overland Rally with me. And um, I kind of told him, you know, I'm kind of, I got this vision for a project in mind. And, you know, I don't, I'm just not sure what engine we should use. And I, I actually, I think I said maybe we should use one of these like four cylinder. Um, EcoBoost, dude, that would have been sweet. Engines that you know, Ford <laughs> yeah, and Chevy, the yeah. great motors, the four-cylinder turbo diesels. That, yeah. They're not turbo, but turbo gas motors. And yeah. Stuff. And uh, my buddy Chris was like, "Dude, you seen that Cummins motor?" And I was like, "Wah wah wah." And then I kind of just like started uh, learning about it, and I was like, "This is perfect, perfect for me." I, it goes, it's got tons of low end torque. Mm-hmm. It's little. I wanted a little engine. I didn't want. Um, I I didn't want a V eight. Right. Um, partly because I kind of already checked that box. Mm-hmm. Um, part because I was worried it might be too much power. Yep. Honestly, um, or power in the wrong places. And I, I, the other thing I wanted was fuel economy. Yeah. We have uh, an anything Scout big gas tank in this truck, and I don't. I can't remember what that is. Probably twenty. Thir- yeah, twenty eight. Twenty eight. Like yeah. And um, it's fine, but I wanted something like exceptional. And um, I use, like, I like Mad Max Fury Road as kind of an inspiration on some things. And, like, yeah, like, I wanted I wanted ridiculous capability on uh, on the basics. Yeah. And one of them was range. Range. That's and a big So one. I wanted range and fuel economy. And so um, the diesel, is, shout out to everybody at Cummins. That, that engine is awesome. If you're thinking about whether it's a good fit for you, it's everything it purports to be. It's everything you hope it is. The R two eight, more. the R two Cummins R two eight, uh, yep. turbo diesel, that Cummins Repower program. Um, if you don't know about it, and Google like Steve it. and Brittany, like the, their team is just amazing. They're too. incredible. Yeah, I love those guys. I, like when I needed help on something on the build, I like kind of cold emailed them, and I was like, "Hi, I'm Stuart. I'm, I'm just I'm just one person who's bought one engine. I'm not right. Like, I'm not anybody serious." And they personally attended to me and, and yeah. you know, and now I have like a, you know, I have a friendship with them. Yeah. Um, and they've, they really helped me awesome. get that truck done. So they're, so they're R2 they're, you're happy with it. And what is, very, what kind of mileage did you get on the, the last, co- the Copper State Overland, you probably did 400 miles on road, off road. Daily, you mean? No, no, like total. Oh, um, no, total probably more because we had, really? we, there were some long days. Wow. I think this was uh, longer than normal. Yeah. They, they, the organizers kind of went out because it was like the fifth year they did it. Yeah. So they were like no, no hold bar. And how'd you do? Even compared to the group, compared to. I, I got approximately better, f- double the fuel economy of. I, I, I didn't actually do the math. Right. But I, I literally had to fuel up half as much as everyone else. Wow. There was one particular day on the event where it was a long, grueling day. It was like 120 miles all on dirt um from it was from lake powell to escalante utah Mm -hmm. and all off-road basically down washes and and can't you know running canyons and everybody was like on fumes when they got to the halfway point the turnaround point Mm -hmm. at escalante where they have really good pizza and everybody's getting gas I had still more than half a tank left. That's really awesome. So I gassed up because why not? What, but I could have done, done the whole day on one I tank. I don't remember on your build. Like we don't have a huge gas tank. It's in 17 it. gallons. It's the 17 stock. 17 gallons and you're, that's awesome. Yeah, I think it's, you tell me, is it is that a four-door tank or it's is a that a two-door, two-door tank? two-door tank. Okay. Which is, yeah, 17, 18 it's, gallons. Killer. It's amazing, man. So you're happy with the motor. Love it. And they also like cool well, like they're, they're yeah. efficient. Yeah. I mean, everybody knows diesel motors are meant to idle and that's where yep. temperature wise, that's, that was another big one. I, you know, I, I don't, in Arizona, you, you got to really think about overheating um, and temperature management of all your components. Yep. So, um, uh, so yeah. And then um, I also wanted an automatic. I am yep. not, I'm not a purist and, and demand that everybody agree that automatic is better off-road. I just like it more. 
Um, and I also I like it more if you can uh, have some ability to control what gear you're in. Yep. But I don't think you, you need it. Um, but I just like it because it's just one less thing to manage. I believe that when you're off-roading that um, there, there, what you have a deficit of is um, there's a lot to look at, a lot to do, a lot to manage and you only have a certain supply of attention to a tr- to allocate to all those things. Right. So if you can reduce the amount of things that require your attention as a driver, the more you can focus on that's the right. other things and the safer and more successful you're going to be. So that's that's a kind of the bottom line on why I like about automatic. And in that again, experimental, you were top Big risk. first 3 people in the country to to do an 8 HP 70 automatic. So it's an yes. 8 speed and again, in our discussion and debate about how much is too much, when do you do like cutting edge technology yeah. versus proven technology? Yep. The transmission has probably been the single, not probably. It is. A hundred percent the single most f- frustrating and like. Yeah. It's biggest risk and probably biggest reward of the whole build. That's right. Cause it's, it's awesome. Yeah. So everything else like, you know, a Denetray axle is tried and true. Quick right. performance axle is tried and true. Um, the. Um, the engine Cummins makes it, you know, it's right. It's you're be good. Dumped, right. Um, it's the Jeep frame. You're fine. So with the eight HP 70, um, Sean and I talked about that a lot and it was, if it wasn't going to be that, it was going to be like a four L 80 or something like yeah. that. Four L 60. Um, which I'm really glad we didn't. I'm like, super glad we didn't. It's a great, the eight HP is really awesome. It is. If you, if you can get it, to, so full disclosure. Yes, I was I was supposed to go on the rally that Cove Copper State Overland one year, and I it missed. It was not. It would not have made the trip. Yeah, I could have gotten it to the starting line, but I would not have finished, and I would have been very unhappy with it. Um, first time around, so I missed one. I big whiff on the, on the plan. Right. And then I had to wait another year to really. Uh, it almost took basically another nine months to get it to that point because you're talking like ready to go nobody in the country could tune the hp 70 it's not a it's not like a like a 4l60 where the aftermarket understands it fully and right. gm it doesn't try to hide it from people the 8 hp 70 is a transmission that is it's an eight speed transmission made by zf that is so it's a european deal that comes in a lot of cars it, right. it became popular in a lot of chryslers um you know following the uh you know the daimler benz merger with chrysler and mercedes um, it's in Audis, it's in BMW wow. sedans, it's mm-hmm. in BMWs, it's in Bentleys, hmm. it's in all, and Jeeps and uh, Ram pickups. It's in a, a lot of uh, Chargers and Challengers. It's in a lot of different vehicles and different applications. And I ultimately was convinced to do it one by Sean's commitment to me that whatever it is, we're, we'll do it together and we'll both figure this out together, and we won't quit until it works. Two, um, really, because you realize with that engine. What really it, it um, is an ideal pairing is because it has a more narrow torque band. Yep. The RPM range is compressed. The torque band, it's wide. The torque band is wide, but within a, right. sh- a smaller RPM range right. compared to a gas motor. Yes. Wouldn't it be awesome to, to have eight gears so that even more than you would be normally, you're you're in the power band. In the, not only are you in the power band, you're in the right part of the power band. One quick note yeah. while we're talking about this. If anyone in the aftermarket that has done number number one they've done one thing and they're like eager to convince you that like we got it all dialed like beware yeah. i understand like there yeah. has to always be the first guy like for us there was my good buddy cam believed in us like with the outrider we had a vision yes we can do this yeah and you need those people that believe in you but it's also like you're the first, bro. This is going to be yeah. So be wary of like. There's a roller coaster associated with that. Yeah, and you have to be, you be willing up for it. Yeah, uh, and I, you know, full dead ass honesty. I I wish it was a less bumpy ride. Right. But um, it turned out okay. Yeah. And I think it's going to end up because it's when it's not completely done. It's not completely perfect. Um, or. Yeah, there's satisfactory. Right. There's little things about it that are still not working right, but um, not the truck. The tra- it's the specific, specifically, yeah. it's it's I I call it drivability. That's what. Yeah. So like in my job, I've worked with not uh, not for an OE, but with OEs a lot in my 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 real job, and 
Um, they call it drivability. It's just like, is it a pain in the ass to drive? Is it intuitive? Does it do what, right. what you expect it to do? And, and, and all those things that are just kind of soft. Is it good enough or not? That maybe don't have a, a quantitative measure. And so, yeah, I've got some, some issues with it still where it either will or won't shift at the right times. Based on the highway, right? In the highway, it doesn't shift up into eighth. It kind of has two overdrives. It has like yeah. a barely overdrive and then a, like a full on overdrive. So it, you can, if you uh, are, are accelerating too quickly, um, it's pretty easily to oh, somehow blow through that point where you would expect it to shift into eighth mm -hmm. and it'll hold seventh. And it, it basically puts additional RPM and temperature into your motor if you want to cruise. If you if you go slowly, you can coax it into eighth, and once you get into eighth, you can you can literally roll at eighty five all day yeah. long. And for the purposes of this show, like it's a little too comp. Like yeah, we could have a whole management about system. It. Like there's all these proprietary. It's, it's things. computer control. Like if yeah. you're anti computers in vehicles, then you shouldn't do either one of these. You do, do a the stick. Cummins. I mean, do a stick. That, in my opinion, yeah, you can do the Cummins still. But, do, but I love the stick. Cummins, and I love the H HP seventy. Yeah. If I like as a builder two ways either do an ax15 or a tr4050 like a, it's a new one that's really big in the aftermarket okay it's like an it shifts like an ax15 okay but it's got the a granny first and a higher tow capacity so okay. it's got a that's nice awesome. street like feel it's yeah. not like a semi feel to like yeah, the clunk, shifter clunk, clunk. um or or i would say if you're going to go automatic i still say the ahp70 so even after all we've learned because because yeah. You were a guinea pig. Now, like fifty yeah. other people have now, done it. Like I was, I was when I first did it. I was like thirty percent dialed in, just not enough to to have confidence to take it on a four right. day trip off road where you're not in towns very much. Second year comes around, and I was like, I call it ninety percent. Okay, good enough to go. Uh, certainly good enough to go. And and any of these unpleasant like situations that were like less than minimum standard drivability, you could drive your way out of them. You could, you could, you had workarounds that didn't ruin your experience. Right. Uh, it's just something you, you want to cl get cleaned up after the yep. fact. And so that's, that's kind of where I am now. Cause that was that yeah, happened great. pretty recently. So, and um, again, like we could have very also happy with uh, when outside of those little niche situations, I, I'm real happy with it. It's a, it's a great pairing. It's that, that part of the experiment really yeah. worked. And it looks awesome. It's just another cool rig. So, yeah. Um, well, we're going to wrap up this episode, but when we come back, not part two, new episode. We're going to talk about car culture, car people. But I, well, I do want to talk through the Ford because that okay. one you stuck with an original old, not original, but but an old platform. It's like a period motor. A period motor. It's not the original say. motor, but it's a period motor. And same with the Boss 302. Another period thing, but you got a yeah. lot of little stuff going on yeah. to and, make and it. And a, a wider range of pros and cons with each. Like definitely things I did right, definitely things I did okay. wrong. Okay, so we'll talk about that. Sweet. Next time. So Stuart, thank you for being on the show. Thank, thank you. you for listening and or watching. And uh, we'll see you next time. <laughs>